This is the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, Georgia, the largest art museum in the American Southeast. In this video, we will begin touring through the galleries of this 1980s postmodern museum building. The museum facade from approximately this angle can be seen in the Marvel film Black Panther, in which the High stood in as the Museum of Great Britain. This was where the villains Killmonger and Claw stole an African vibranium artifact and murdered a bunch of employees. The High got its start in 1905 as the Small Scale Atlanta Art Association, however the museum has somewhat of a tragic history after that, which is memorialized by this authentic Rodin sculpture outside. In 1962, 106 Atlanta art patrons were sponsored by the Growing Museum Association to visit Paris, France. Sadly, when they were about to return home, they all died in a devastating plane crash at the Orly Airport in Paris, which killed 130 people in what was at the time the worst single-plane aviation disaster in world history. After that tragedy, the French government loaned Whistler's mother from the Louvre to be shown at the old museum here in Atlanta, and also donated the shade, sculpted by Auguste Rodin around 1880. Another fantastic outdoor installation is House 3 by Roy Lichtenstein. Like its counterpart on the National Mall in DC, this cartoon house is an optical illusion which appears to distort its directionality depending on which angle you view it from, an illusion which is much more pronounced in person. A full rainbow has materialized above Roy Lichtenstein's house and the city of Atlanta. Starting out inside, here's an Ellsworth Kelly triptych. Here's a portrait of Harriet Hattie High, the woman who donated her mansion to be the original art museum in 1926. There are three sculptures by William Wetmore Story, an American who had an affinity for classical Rome and lived much of his life in Italy. He would usually take on subjects from Greek tragedies, biblical stories, and the like. Here is his portrayal of Cleopatra, which supposedly inspired Story's friend Nathaniel Hawthorne to write his 1860 novel The Marble Fawn. On a balcony beyond the lobby, there is a colorful installation called Happy Joy Lanta, which features piñatas and Mexican techniques of Papel Picado. Looks like it was a fun community project. This is the grand four-story atrium at the heart of the museum, complete with a skylight. The switchback ramp leading up to all the galleries is definitely reminiscent of the spiraling ramp in the rotunda of the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in Manhattan, which was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. In this episode, we'll check out the American art galleries on the third level, while the European contemporary and folk art are featured in separate videos. That is a sculpture of Nydia, the blind flower girl from Pompeii by Randolph Rogers. It's based on the popular 1830s novel The Last Days of Pompeii. On the right is a portrait done by Ralph Earle, who was a loyalist and fled to London during the revolution, but he decided to come back to America due to the post-independence market for commissions. This is a painting by Samuel F.B. Morse of his family. He started his career as a portrait painter, however he eventually came to view himself as a field artist, so instead he developed Morse code for the Telegraph. Those are the Inman portraits, a group of 15 portraits painted by Henry Inman in the early 1830s. These were part of a series of 100 portraits secretly painted of dignitaries from tribal nations who visited Washington around that time in order to document their appearances for the government. And next to the Native American leaders, there's a little Christopher Columbus statue done in 1865 by Edmonia Lewis, a sculptor of African and indigenous descent who spent most of her career working in Rome, Italy. There is a Native American woman at his feet. These are sculptures by Joseph Mosier. On the left is Pocahontas from 1864, and on the right is Ruth, a white woman who was raised by the Narragansett in James Fenimore Cooper's novel Wept of the Wish Tun Wish. Here is a fantastic painting of Niagara Falls done in 1855 by Régis-François Genoux, 
a French émigré artist who worked at the dawn of American and French landscape painting. This is a Western landscape by the German-born artist Johann Hermann Karmanke. And this is an 1840s still life with shells. This is an 1837 Vermont landscape by Asher Brown Durand, one of the first American landscape painters. Thomas Cole is one of the great early American artists. And this is an example of his earlier paintings from 1826 Tao the Temptist. He did make this a distinctively American scene with the modest frontier homestead in the background amidst the wild landscape. Here is a small 1863 preparatory oil sketch by Albert Bierstadt, who is known for his grand western scenes. This one is titled The Pioneers of the Woods in California. Martin Johnson Heat achieved success by painting flat salt marshes on the east coast, like this one from 1886. And this is Two Hummingbirds with an Orchid, painted by Heat in 1875. He made three trips to South America searching for exotic flora and fauna to paint. That nude sculpture of Pandora was found to be a bit controversial for Victorian audiences when it was unveiled in 1851. Here's a scene from Washington Irving's tale Wolfert Weber's Golden Dream. Here Weber celebrates his newfound wealth as a Manhattan real estate magnate back in the Dutch colonial days. The moonlit market is phenomenal. Painted by Dutch-born artist Johan Mengels Culverhouse, it was clearly influenced by his studies of Caravaggio's Chiaroscuro. Here's a piece by Sanford Gifford, who is one of the outstanding landscape artists of New England. This is a salon wall display, reminiscent of a common 19th century style of art installation where everything is jumbled together on a wall. There's a Rembrandt Peel portrait and a Thomas Moran landscape right next to each other up there. Here is the Libyan Sibyl by William Wetmore Story, who created the great sculptures we saw earlier. Another important American sculptor who would take on classical subjects was Hiram Powers, who carved that bust. Here is an Abraham Lincoln Memorial bust from 1866 in the South. It has neoclassical touches like the cape. Abe's looking straight out of classical Rome. This landscape was done by louis Rémy Mignon, who is one of the few Southerners to succeed in the competitive New York art world. However, the Charlestonian maintained his allegiances to the South when the Civil War broke out, and left for England, never to return. This is titled Self-Defense from 1854. There's an advertisement for an Uncle Tom's Cabin play in the background. Here is the Woodland Stream, an idol by Robert S. Duncanson who was a phenomenal African-American artist based in Cincinnati. He stayed far away from the border city when the Civil War broke out. He painted this one while staying in Scotland. And this 1845 painting is representative of a common stereotype of an African-American sleeping on the job. The placard says he's in suspension between enslavement and emancipation. Here's some fine American silver. This is a work by George Innes, The Passing Storm. That is a portrait by William Merritt Chase of his daughter Alice. This definitely showcases his German training with the thick impressionistic brush strokes. There's an opulent Gilded Age cabinet next to a piece by Julian Alden Weir, an American impressionist. I like this scene with the penny farthing bikes. Here is some bric-a-brac from Damascus, Rome, and Sevilla from 1880, highlighting the American craze for exotic bric-a-brac in the late 19th century. This is The Expansionist or The Traveled Man, painted by Francis Davis Millet after his extensive trip through Asia at the height of American imperialism in the Pacific. There's a sculpture of Raphael and a marble portrait of the famed soprano Jenny Lind, often known for her association with P.T. Barnum. This century vase was made for display at the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. The visage of George Washington adorns the vase. Here is the quaint 1886 Fourth of July parade as seen by Alfred Cornelius Howland in his hometown of Walpole, New Hampshire. 
There's a fancy chair from the William Vanderbilt Mansion that was on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. That no longer exists. In the late 19th century, paintings for the sake of aesthetic qualities as opposed to narratives became popular in America, especially due to increased exposure to foreign civilizations and art forms which became infused with others. This is Moonlight at the Mills of Pont Avon by Gaines Ruger Donahoe, certainly influenced by James McNeil Whistler. Here is a beautiful portrait by Joseph DeCamp titled The Blue Mandarin Coat, with a woman wearing a blue kimono. Robert Henry of the Ashcan School made this portrait of the Lady in Black Velvet. Here is an energetic 1926 work by William Glackens depicting the beach at Lille Adam, in a village north of Paris. Norwegian-born artist Jonas Lee painted this rather optimistic scene of New York City's industrialization along the East River as it may have appeared in 1914. There's a beautiful stained glass window by the prominent multimedium artist John LaForge. Here are some examples of turn of the century American furnishings. On the right, there's a painting inspired by the Dutch de Stij movement of geometric abstraction, joined by a chair that was designed by the prominent de Stij designer Herat Rietveld. And on the left, there's a Frank Lloyd Wright stained glass window from the Avery Coonley Playhouse in Riverside, Illinois. Frank Lloyd Wright also designed this strikingly streamlined desk and chair in the 1930s for the SC Johnson headquarters in Racine, Wisconsin. This is a work by one of America's greatest landscape painters, Thomas Moran, but this is an East Coast scene, an old bridge in East Hampton on Long Island. There are some great modernist pieces here. The American South does have a unique modern art heritage, so several of these are by Southern-based artists. This is a work by Joseph Albers of Asheville, North Carolina's Experimental Black Mountain College. It is tiled to Oaxaca, 1943, which was inspired by his trip to Oaxaca, Mexico to visit pre-Columbian ruins. There's a 1931 work of Marsden Hartley, depicting a harsh and lonely landscape on the Blueberry Highway in Dogtown, Massachusetts. Here's the Shapes of Landscape Space No. 3 by Stuart Davis, who worked with an improvised abstract cubist style to express what he saw in America. That is a Red Canna by Georgia O'Keeffe. This was painted in Lake George, New York shortly after beginning her relationship with the photographer and modern art promoter Alfred Stieglitz in 1918. While she is usually associated with Manhattan or New Mexico, she painted a lot of scenes around Lake George, too. Here is a bird motif by Irene Rice Perea, who often contrasted industrial and traditional objects in unusual combinations. In this one, she used oil paint, enamel, and gold leaf on glass. These are studies for a painting titled Results of Poor Housing by Hale Woodruff of Atlanta, critiquing Atlanta's segregationist housing policies. Here are various examples of 1930s American abstraction, like Connection by George L. R. Morris who utilized geometric forms. This is a rather vibrant portrait of industrial designer John Vassos, who is known for designing the subway turnstile. There is a work by Mark Rothko here at the High. This is number 73 from 1952, which the placard considers as one of his mature works with these stacked rectangles and muted colors intended to evoke emotion in the viewer. This is the duet by Adolf Gottlieb from 1962, which is reminiscent of the binary sunset from Star Wars. And this is an abstract expressionist work by Norman Wilfred Lewis, who was the only black artist to participate in the famous closed-door sessions of Studio 35, which were really important in developing the style and movements. This 1960 piece, titled Barker in a Crowd, is meant to abstractly depict a Barker stump speaker in Harlem who would call on people to take action for civil rights. So that was an excellent American art collection here at the High, but there is plenty more to see. The European section is also really strong, as is the contemporary and the American folk art section, which is probably my favorite. I also got to see two special exhibitions, one based around Belle Epoque Paris, and the other on Beatrix Potter, so make sure to check out the other episodes, which are linked in the description. 
Additionally, please like this video, share it, and subscribe to the channel for more art history, museum, and travel content around the United States and Europe. Thanks for watching!